that that would be um, spiritual insanity <laughs> to not use technology. That would be equivalent to not using the printing press to print the Bible. This is Equip and Engage, a podcast by Subsplash, exploring how ministry, technology, and innovation come together to equip churches around the world to engage their communities. Welcome to another episode of Equip and Engage, a Subsplash podcast. Once again, I'm John Crabtree, a ministry consultant here, and that means I get the privilege of talking to thousands of churches a year to tell them about how Subsplash can come alongside them and uh, help them equip and engage their congregations with the gospel. I'm so very excited to welcome Dr. Derwin Gray today. Dr. Gray, welcome. Thank you. Glad to, glad to be with you. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, Dr. Gray, for those of uh, out there who are listening who might not know you, um, I, I wanted to just kind of give you a chance to tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, your ministry and work. Yeah, so uh, my wife, Vicki, and I have been married for 28 years. Uh, We actually met 30 years ago as college students at Brigham Young, so we love it out west. We actually thought uh, we would move and live in Seattle, but God Mm -hmm. had other plans. But we met at Brigham Young uh, my freshman year, and we've been together ever since. Vicki's the co-founder of Transformation Church. She's an executive strategist. We have a 24-year-old daughter that... uh, attends UNC Wilmington. She's getting ready to graduate as a psych major in December. Uh, We have a son that is 20. He's a sophomore at the University of Montana, uh, double majoring in political science and German with a minor in linguistics. And my wife and I co-founded Transformation Church 10 years ago. Uh, Our passion and desire was to plant a Pauline New Testament church, meaning that Jesus not only forgives sins, but he creates a family with different colored skins. And this family is a family of oneness. And this family exists to bring glory to the father as they share the life of Christ with each other and those who are yet to discover him. So for us, uh, we planted an intentionally multi-ethnic church because we believe that that's God's heartbeat, that God made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis 12, one through three. And he said, uh, through you, I'm going to give you this big old family and Jesus comes as the one to fulfill that covenant through his sinless life, his atoning death on the cross, his resurrection and the sending of the spirit by the father and son to create this family. Now let me pause here. And I think this is very important. If we don't know the story of God, we're going to be swept off of our feet by other stories. Politics tells a story. Um, Greed tells a story. Uh, Sexual morality tells a story. We are hardwired for story. And God has given us the greatest story. And it's a love story of a father who says, I'm going to get my family back. Adam and Eve messed it up in the Garden of Eden. Noah and his family messed it up. Tower of Babel is more, not more about building a tower, but humanity's rebellion once again. And in Genesis 12, God says, enough, Abraham, through you, your seed is going to come. And that seed is Jesus, the true and rightful Lord and King. And by grace, he invites us into that kingdom. And so we're just not saved from something, which is sin and death. We're also saved for something which is display the glory of God. And, and, and so we wanted to plant a Pauline New Testament church like that. Uh, my wife is from Montana. The town she grew up in had more bars than churches. She came to faith through a woman at work in Indianapolis. I came to faith through a teammate uh, when I played for the Indianapolis Colts. His nickname was the Naked Preacher. And every day after practice, he would get his Bible and he'd share Christ and he'd have just a towel on. So his nickname was the naked preacher. And so that's, that's, that's a little bit of, of our background is we love Jesus. We love his church and we believe that his church, his people have a vital role to play in his story. Each and every one of us. Wonderful. Wonderful. So much great in there. And we're going to dive even further into it two points of connection that that I think you'll appreciate. You said your son is double majoring in political science and German. 
funny enough, those were my two majors as well. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's that, amazing. Yeah. The other point yeah. of contact is that I grew up in Indianapolis and I actually grew up <laughs> watching you because I'm a huge Colts fan. And I know you got oh, there my. prior to the Peyton Manning glory years, but you were That's actually right. part of that team that was the most successful, the 95 AFC championship team. Yeah, I was, uh, you are a true fan. I was a, I was a team captain uh, for the Colts. And uh, we, uh, as you know, we beat Pittsburgh for basically 58 minutes of the game. But in scoring, instead of scoring touchdowns, we kicked field goals. And uh, they hit us on a fourth and like one. And then they went down and scored. And then Harbaugh threw the Hail Mary that we thought Aaron Bailey caught. But he didn't. And that was it. That was it, man. That was uh, I. I believe we would have beat the Dallas Cowboys that year because the momentum we had was just outrageous. That's a that's a kickback to my childhood right there, and <laughs> to a different era in your life too. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, hey, I'm I'm very honored to be the one to to get to host this podcast for a variety of reasons. Uh, prior to your most recent book, which we're going to talk about, that book, the most recent one called "The Good Life." what Jesus teaches about true happiness. We, uh, you also wrote The High Definition Leader. Yeah. And this book has actually inspired, like I mentioned, my pastor here in the Seattle area to move towards a more multicultural, multi-ethnic mission-shaped community ourselves. And so tell us about that transition from football player to doctorate. I know your yeah. doctorate is hugely influential in the work you you and your wife have yeah. done, and then from the doctorate to founding Transformation Church, and 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 so on. Yeah. So, uh, in essence, after my wife and I came to faith in 1997, both of us just developed an incredible hunger to know Him. And in 1998, I signed with the Carolina Panthers as a free agent, and so uh, I played in three games, and then I got hurt. And I put a, got put on injured reserve. So all I could do literally was rehab my knee and read the Bible. And so both my wife and I would just read the Bible, read the Bible. Uh, we went to a, a, a Mormon school. So our Mormon friend said we were wrong. My grandmother was kind of quasi Jehovah's Witness a little bit, but they kicked her out because she would cuss and smoke. And so, but we had people saying, hey, well, you know, you guys are wrong. So we studied the Bible and we developed a love for apologetics and sound theology. And uh, we started a nonprofit ministry called One Heart at a Time. And uh, my wife would organize everything and I would go and speak. I didn't know what an evangelist was. I just knew Jesus loved me. He loved them and he wanted them to know his love. But in about 2005, both my wife and I were just concerned with the lack of ethnic diversity in the church. We couldn't understand why in areas where there was diversity, the nightclub was more diverse than Jesus's club. Mm -hmm. And then the more questions we began to ask, we saw that Christians actually liked it that way. And then as we got into ministry, we actually saw that there was something called the homogeneous unit principle that teaches you to build churches off of people who look alike, think alike, same ethnicity, same social economic status, same politics, then you can grow a church that way, but you can also breed spiritual ignorance that way and racism that way and a bunch of unhealthy things. And so God was like, well, you can criticize or create. I've gifted, I've called the Jew. And so February 7, 2010 is when we planted a Transformation Church. And it's in essence... Our vision is the vision of Jesus. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Great commandment. Our great, yeah, great commandment leading to the great com commission. Go make disciples of all na nations. So the way we say it at Transformation Church is that we are a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, mission-shaped community that loves God completely loves ourselves correctly, loves our neighbors compassionately. So when I love my neighbor as myself, my neighbor is multi-ethnic, multi-generational, and we are fueled by the mission of Christ. So great commandment, great commission. Well, 
our first service, 701 people came. Wow. Yeah, it, it was absolutely crazy. I prayed for 700 to come because I was too naive to know that 700 people don't show up for a church plant opening. If I would have known that, I wouldn't have prayed that. And ever since then, God has grown us into a healthy, robust, multi-ethnic church. Well, in about 2013, people started asking me, like, well, how do you do it? How, 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 do, how do you do it? So in 2015, I wrote the book, The High Definition Leader, uh, Building Multi-Ethnic Churches in a Multi-Ethnic World. And in essence, what I'm doing is I'm walking through really the life of the Apostle Paul and specifically the book of Ephesians and how Paul used the gospel because the outflow of the gospel is this. God is faithful to give Abraham his family. Jesus is the one who guarantees it. And so through Jesus's redemptive work, this blood bought, spirit filled and sealed people is Abraham's family. And this family is called the church. This family is comprised of Jews and Gentiles. This family is every nation, tribe, and tongue. And so the, the aspects of racism and racial justice that we see in America, no disrespect to the Black Lives Matter movement, but racism is a sin that Jesus hates. Racism is a sin that the Father hates. Racism is a sin that the Holy Spirit hates. Love, racism is a failure to love your neighbor as you love yourself individually and systemically. So our motivation of racial reconciliation is a gospel reason. And so people started asking me, so that's why I wrote the high definition leader. And also from that, we've developed a round table called the high definition leader as well. And this year, uh, November 9th and 10th, we're actually going to do it online, which is going to make it better and more effective. And there's going to be some things that we're going to add to where we're going to be able to reach a wider audience. We're praying that thousands would sign up for it to view it online because this is the most that I have seen my white brothers and sisters authentically interested in racial justice. I think for so long, it's been like, well, that's a nice thing to do. But the eight minutes and 46 seconds of George Floyd being murdered when the cop's knee was on his neck and with COVID happening, everything had slowed, up, slowed down enough for people to listen. But it's important to understand that Transformation Church and the gospel um, racism and a desire to have a multi-ethnic reconciled church. Um, it's not based on Obama was a pre president. It's not based on slavery in America. It's based on God making a covenant with Abraham. And so for us, this is intrinsic to who we are. Um, a gospel that will only send you to heaven when you die, but doesn't bring heaven to earth while you live is not a full gospel. This is actually a perfect segue into your new book that you wrote, The Good Life, What Jesus Teaches About Finding True Happiness. And I, I want to dwell specifically on something you wrote in chapter five, which is titled, Happy Are the Hungry and Thirsty. And it begins with Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And it ends with Psalm 106, 3, which says, How happy are those who uphold justice, who practice righteousness at all times. And you write in that chapter, we often ask God when we witness suffering or, in, or injustice, where are you? I think he responds, where are you, church? I left you on earth and deposited my life in you to continue my ministry and mission. You are my hands and feet. You are salt and light, the great city on a hill. And so Amen. this is the idea of theology informing practice. Can you read that again? That blessed my soul, man. <laughs> We often ask God when we witness suffering or injustice, where are you? I think he responds, where are you, church? I left you on earth and deposited my life in you to continue my ministry and mission. You are my hands and feet. You are salt and light, the great city on a hill. See Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Amen. And so when you, when you write these words and you think about the high definition leader 
and the good life, you actually gave some examples in that same chapter of people who had, had taken that, who, who had taken that ministry and mission that Jesus gave to them. There was one in specific that really hit me deep because you and a couple of people, part of transformation had been involved in prison ministry and had mm-hmm. actually met a prison minister there or a prisoner there. And uh, tell, tell us about that story. Um, this older couple had retired. They began to volunteer at a prison in South Carolina and uh, they stumbled across one of my books and they were like, man, let's call this guy. I love this book. Let's see if he'll come speak. Well, they got in contact with a friend. That friend's like, yeah, this is, uh, Irwin is his mentor. Call him. They got a hold to us. And they were like, would you like to come speak in a prison? I'm like, uh, yeah, exactly. So we went, it went great. The pris- the men in- incarcerated loved it. A bunch of them got saved. It was awesome. They said, can we have more tapes? Then all of a sudden, not tapes, but CDs. All of a sudden they're like, can we be a church? And the answer is, well, of course. And so there's this one inmate, his, his-, his name is Brian. And Brian uh, led worship and was the leader, just a real gentle, humble spirit. And so as Transformation Church Kershaw Prison continued to grow and thrive and men are getting saved. And I mean, I'm baptizing dudes who were former Nazis, former Black Panthers, former Muslims, former, I mean, you name it. I mean, it's incredible. And so Brian was up for parole But in the state of South Carolina, if you killed someone, you pretty much won't get parole. And Brian in his early 20s, um, in a steroid rage, blacked out and like killed his best friend. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even remember it. So he had never gotten parole. And what we said to him, based on the way that we see you serve and the way you minister, the way you love, if you ever get, get out, you have a position at Transformation Church. And uh, he never thought he was going to get get out, but he would go to parole. And lo and behold, somehow, some way, they paroled him. And he's been on staff at Transformation Church for a few years now. He'll sing from time to time on our worship team. Um, He's on our care team to where if people are in crisis, he's ministering to them. He's also going back into the prisons and... Uh, establishing prison ministries and encouraging the prisoners. And if you were to see him and people would see him, they would never know that in a former life, this man killed another man. Now he he has incredible remorse. He's tried to recompense, but it hurts him. He says on that day, I ruined two families, mine and the family of the man that his life has taken, but God has, recycled that hurt, that pain, that dysfunction, and is using him powerfully. And when Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. The Greek word blessed that Jesus uses is the word makros. And it means happy. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Well, what exactly is righteousness? Well, righteousness in that context is the rest of the Beatitudes. Poor in spirit means God reliant. To mourn means what breaks God's heart breaks my heart. To be humble means I don't think less of myself. I just think less about myself and more about God. Um, To be merciful obviously means to give mercy. To be pure in heart means God is my purity. Um, To be a peacemaker means I'm building bridges, not burning things down. That's what righteousness is, and that's the life that we're that we were created for because i know there's a lot of people going well derwin god doesn't want us to be happy well first of all that's not true that's a heresy second of all we have to define what happiness is happiness with the culture means good things are going your way you're happy it's an emotion the happiness that jesus wants to give to us is a happiness that's not based on if good things are happening it's based on god making us good for the world, that our happiness is now contingent upon him and his gracious work in us, not our circumstances. So this way, I like to say it. Happiness means this. 
Happiness is about becoming who you were meant to be and who you were meant to be is a Jesus Christ lookalike. Mm. And, and this, this brings me a little bit to, it's the beginning of 2020. You're about to launch this book. The COVID pandemic picks up and, and then we do have videos that are circulating like the killing of Ahmaud Arbery, the uh, killing of George Floyd. We, we hear stories and so how have you navigated that in your own community? You, you, you give a little bit, you've given us a little bit, but um, any, any other uh, tips or how to's? <laughs> yeah, you, 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 know, you know, Jonathan, for us, we have been doing this from day one. And so it wasn't really a big adjustment for us that we had been preaching that the gospel heals racial trauma, racial pain, racial injustice. So it, it wasn't a huge adjustment or step for us. I think the first thing is, if we don't have racial justice in Jesus's church, then there's no hope for outside of the church. And even if you look at statistics today, uh, multi-ethnic churches that are racially reconciled are like a unicorn. It's still incredibly rare. Um, I would say is, God has been gracious to us, and we've worked hard in the spirit to create a gospel culture to where this is normative. And so we see people, uh, we see uh, our white brothers and sisters, which our church is probably 55% white. We see them, they have now more tools in their toolboxes to be able to engage the culture. You know, um, and what I would say is, for minorities, it's this thing of vengeance without just or, or justice without Jesus is vengeance. And I think that's what you see with buildings burning down, all this stuff, that that's justice without G G G Jesus. Justice with Jesus means there's forgiveness for the perpetrator too that Jesus's table is big enough for the woman caught in adultery and the men who are going to throw stones at her, that he changes both hearts. Um, and so for us, this has, this has, this has been normative, but for me, it's been more about equipping other churches, you know, uh, zooming in to preach at their churches and having conversations. And I would encourage particularly white pastors who this is new for, for them. Don't try to be the expert. That's, that's hubris. When racial reconciliation and justice in the gospel is a hobby and not a habit, you're going to mess up. This requires that this is a spiritual habit, not a hobby. Yes. Amen. Okay, so moving the conversation a little bit here to kind of close it out. We're a technology company. We, we serve you on your TV apps. You've seen an incredible explosion of, of downloads yeah. and interactions since March um, and, and almost 4,000 TV app downloads since March 2020. So nice work to your team. You've clearly you. put the right people in place. But for a multi-generational church that you are, my, my conversations with your team have led me just to understand that you as a church in general do not shy away from using all the wonderful technology that's at our fingertips today. <laughs> that, that would be um, spiritual insanity <laughs> to not use technology. That would be equivalent to not using the printing press to print the Bible. The modern day Jacob well today is technology, the internet. Uh, two years ago, or actually a year ago, about this time, we had a big audacious prayer. We said, Lord, would you bless us to have 2,000 people that watch our messages online to where we can encourage believers and reach those who don't know you? A year later, God said, okay, um, I'll give you your 2,000 and I'll see you 98,000 more. So we have over 100,000 people watching through our various forms, through your incredible app, all types of stuff, YouTube, Facebook, all that, all that, right? So it would be ridiculous if we didn't use that. 
since the start of this year, we've grown probably from active participants from 4,500 to maybe, well, it's definitely over 7,000. Like we are literally experiencing revival at Transformation Church. Praise God. And uh, Dan Ruddy actually was ahead of the curve. He was saying a few years ago, hey, we got to amp up our technology, our apps and, and all this stuff. And so moving forward, we're going to have physical campuses, but the digital campus is going to remain. And so what I want to say to pastors that are listening, man, get the app, whatever you can do to get into the modern day Jacobs. Well, you have to do it. And, um, Gen Z lives on the internet. That's all that they know. And, and, we have found that most unbelievers watch online for several months before they actually physically come to the building. And so uh, if the apostle Paul was alive today, he would definitely have an app. <laughs> well, we've, we've seen that same thing. So it's, you know, it, it's definitely there. And, and I guess maybe kind of to land the plane, how does something like, TV apps and, and everything else you have going on fit into that kind of multi-generational strategy. You talked a little bit about Gen Z. Um, yeah. Tell me I'm more out, about that. So let me give you an example. So my mother-in-law, don't tell her I said this, she's 76. And by the way, she's in, she's phenomenal shape. She skis, she water skis. I mean, it's incredible. Anyway, you know, so she uses technology, um, when we were on vacation in Montana, I had filmed services or messages before I left. And so I got to watch the sermons with her and her small group. And so they're in their 60s, they're in their late 50s, some in their 70s. And it's not just Gen Z that's using apps, it's everybody. And it's only going to increase. It's only going to increase, and I think it's a lack of stewardship if we don't develop that. So let me, let me talk to the pastors who are unsure about technology. Number one is become a student. Number two, number two, get some young creative people around you to teach you, to coach you, um, but it's so valuable. And 10 years ago, if you would have told me, Derwin, uh, you're preaching by vid video. I would have said, no way, man. No way I'm doing that. No way. Uh, but God changed my heart because I was at a conference. The auditorium was big. The preacher was preaching. And I sensed the Holy Spirit say, what are you looking at? And I was like, I'm looking at the screen. He goes, oh, okay. You know, and at that moment, it shifted. Like, I've been watching the screen the whole time, and I actually see him better. And that shifted. And so we need to make sure that we're using and leveraging technology because there are millions and billions of people who are going to come in contact. They just may be, they may Google like depression, help, and your church service may come up and you'd be an answer to their prayer. Amen. That's powerful. Well, I, I want to thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Gray, for, for being on today and being generous with your time. I also want to give people a chance to find you, your book, uh, wherever that might be. And, and just a quick plug, too, it's, it's awesome that the foreword to your book is from Beth Moore, uh, as her ministry is also a partner of ours. And so, uh, but yeah, tell, tell us where people can find you, your book, your books, yeah, so, and more. Yeah, you can you can buy The Good Life and HD Leader anywhere books are sold. Uh, if you want to find me, just go to derwinlgray.com, derwinlgray.com, and that'll lead you to all the links of Transformation Church and all my books and the round table and everything. Well, thanks again so much. And to viewers and listeners, thank you again for tuning in to another episode of Equip and Engage. We would be honored if you would uh, subscribe and rate our podcast, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to Equip and Engage, where we're sharing insights learned from thousands of conversations with leaders and pastors around the world. To follow along with these conversations, subscribe today or visit our website.